right, so uh, sorry for the ridiculously uh, broad uh, title. Um, so this is who I am. I work at the Canadian Centre for Climate Modelling and Analysis, the same group that George works in. In fact, George was the, was the founder of our, of our group. My talk is going to be in halves. In the first half, I'm going to talk about warming slowdown since 1920. And this is work with these uh, people here, including Shang Peng. And the second half, I'm going to talk about cooling North American winter since 2002. And this is with Michael Sigmund, a colleague of mine and long-term collaborator. We've mainly worked on problems to do with polar ozone uh, depletion and its impacts on Antarctic sea ice and so on. So this is a new kind of new territory for us. So I appreciate any feedback I can get from you. So we'll start with the first, uh, the first topic here in a familiar plot. The black curve is an observational estimate of global mean surface temperature from 1920 to about now. And of course, what we see here are a variety of, of ups and downs superimposed on a long-term warming trend. Now the question we, simple question we ask here is, what are the dominant spatial structures that underlie these you know, variety of, of ups and downs? So that's what we're after. And we're gonna answer this question using a particular approach. And I'm gonna describe that approach uh, to you now. So step one in the approach is to compute the CMIP5 model and realization mean global mean surface temperature. And that's the red curve that you see there. It's, it's long-term trend has been adjusted downward slightly to match that of the observations. This doesn't affect our conclusions, but it does make for a better looking, a better looking picture. So that's step one. Step two is to remove this time series from the observed surface temperature at every grid point in space by linear regression. Okay, and that leaves us with the observations absent any external, external forced uh, signal. Now, of course, this can't be identically true, but we argue, and this is really the crux of the paper, we argue in several different ways, including using a large initial condition ensemble, that this seems to work very well. The next step is to then apply three -year running, a three-year running mean across this, this observational data set and perform an EOF decomposition um, retaining only a minimum number of EOFs. And these are going to be the spatial structures that we're interested here in. And I'm not going to show them to you until the end of this part of my presentation because I want the anticipation to build up to a, you know, a fever pitch. <clears throat> At that, the next step is to compute you know, from these grids the observed, uh, reconstructed observed global mean surface temperature. And I'll refer to this as the residual in the sense that we think of this as being uh, due only to internal variability and not, forced, uh, and not forced response. And then we can add back the original CMF5 global mean surface temperature to get the total, okay? So it's a simple, straightforward procedure. And the consequence is here. So this is the same figure that I started off with. The black curve, again, is the observed estimate. And the blue curve, you know, that goes along with it is what one obtains using this procedure and retaining just two of these observed EOFs. And you want to be impressed by how good the agreement is. It's, it's excellent. A closer uh, comparison is made if you look at the residuals, that is if you remove the externally forced uh, signal, and that's what this plot shows here. So these are global mean surface temperature anomalies. The black, again, are the observations. The red is what one obtains if you retain only one of these observed EOFs, in which case you get a pretty good reproduction of the historical evolution. In this case, the correlation between the red and the black curve is 0.8, you know, so about 64% of the variance is explained. The blue curve is where you retain that EOF and another one. So we have two EOFs, in which case you get an even better uh, reproduction. And now the correlation is, point, is 0.94. And you can notice in either case that we get this, you know, in the, in the recent period, we get these declining anomalies, which presumably offset the anthropogenic warming to produce the hiatus that we're talking about. <clears throat> that we're talking about here. And I think what's interesting, you know, having done this calculation, the interesting thing is that whereas these two EOFs explain only a very small fraction of the overall spatial variance in, 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 surf, in observed surface temperature, they together explain nearly all of the variance, temporal variance, in global mean surface temperature. Okay, so that's kind of the technique and the result in a nutshell. More relevant, perhaps, well, certainly to this particular discussion, are GMST decadal trends. So here we take the curves that I've just shown you and we compute you know, running decadal trends and plot them at their central year of every, of every decade. So again, the black curve is for observations. And when I first looked at that, 
this, you know, I noticed how large these swings are. So for example, in observations in the 1930s, there was 0.2 of a degree warming. I presume that's associated with the US Dust Bowl. And just a decade later, there was a 0.3 uh, degree uh, cooling. So we do get these, you know, large excursions. This model where you, where you retain only two of the observed EOFs uh, shown in blue, you know, reproduces these swings very well. It's not perfect. There are imperfections that would represent the fact that we haven't captured all of the internal variability. We might be biasing some forced signal that we think we removed, but we haven't, or there might be some there that we didn't know we should have and we don't. Um, and you can notice too how well we reproduce the hiatus. If you look at the last point here, so this is the last decade, at which point the observed decadal trend and this reconstructed trend are spot on. So this seems to be a useful uh, procedure. Um, and here are the EOFs now, and, and there's probably not going to be very many surprises here. The first EOF pattern is shown on the, on the top, and of course it looks a lot like the IPO structure, and that's confirmed in the panel below. So this is where we've taken the kind of canonical IPO index, and we've regressed it against detrended grids of observed um, surface temperature, and you can see there's a very close correspondence. The pattern correlation is 0.8, so again, you know, a little over 60 percent of the variance is explained uh, by the I IPO, but not all of it. I mean, you can see IPO, dominant IPO features, but there's others in the EOF pattern that aren't, wouldn't be associated with the IPO directly, particularly in the southern, in the southern ocean. The second and third EOFs are not shown here because their contribution to global mean surface temperature is canceling because their spatial patterns are more or less in quadrature. So they cancel and don't contribute. The EOF that does contribute is the fourth EOF, which is this pair that I've been referring to when I talk about two observed EOFs. And it has uh, you know, a structure that's dominated in the northern in the northern latitudes. It has some overtones of the AMO in the North Atlantic, and that's indicated by the bottom panel where we've regressed the AMO index against detrended global mean surface temperature and have a correlation of about 0.33. It has some overtones in the North Pacific of the North Pacific West, uh, West pattern, um, but it generally kind of defies a neat description in terms of modes that we're familiar with. But the point is, that these two patterns alone are the patterns that underlie the variations, you know, the variability in global mean surface temperature that we see in the historical record. Now, I don't know how that, you know, if that's helpful in terms of the predictability problem, but it does tell us that with a very few number of degrees of freedom, we can reproduce the historical evolution of global mean surface temperature going back to at least 1920. So that's the first, uh, the first part of my presentation. <clears throat> the second part has to do with cooling North American winters. So this is a plot of temperature anomalies over the, in winter, December, January, February, over the last 13 uh, winters, averaged over the central region of North America. And there is, as you can see, a cooling trend, and that reflects primarily the fact that there has been a prevalence of relatively cold winters in the latter part of this record. We're all familiar with the cold winter in 2013. 2014. And the question is, you know, why is this, why is this happening? Now this rather complicated uh, graphic introduces the actors in this, in this story. And so let me go through it. These are winter trends in all cases. There are a number of variables shown here. Winter trends since 2002. The blue shading shows us the, the major regions of cooling. Uh, there's one in Eurasia that's been referenced already. There's this cooling in North America, in the central part of North America, indicated by you know, the lower box. And that extends up into the northwest of North America with the, with the box above it. You'll realize in a minute why I'm discriminating these two areas. And the third uh, region of cooling is, of course, in the equatorial Pacific that we've heard a lot about. The arrow, arrows indicate the main region of trade wind intensification. And you can see that. In, in situ, that intensification is associated with cooling, those are the blue shades, and associated with drying, which are the brown contours. And they're also associated downstream with warming in the West Pacific and moistening, okay? Now there is a, some thinking that that warming is the cause of the cooling. And this is being put forward in a number, number of places, including by Tim Palmer in a piece in 
in nature. And the thinking is that this, you know, enhanced convection generates a Rossby, you know, wave train, a teleconnection that, that teleconnects to North America and has produced the cooling. And that that is possible is made plausible by the gray contours. The, these gray contours are contours of, of sea level pressure trend. And those contours are best described as the Aleutian, Aleutian low weakening with, an associate, with associated uh, ridging over the continent. And this presumably uh, you know, is advecting systematically cold air into central North America and producing this prevalence of, of cold North American winters. So that you know, would seem to fit. But what we're going to try to do here is see if it really holds water or air, if you like. And we're going to do this um, by throwing everything but the kitchen sink at the problem. Um, and these are the things that we're going to use. We're going to use a 100-member initial condition ensemble that we have using the Canadian Earth System Climate Model. So this is the you know, CAN ESM2 that was part of our SEMA 5 contribution. We're going to use a 10-member ma pacemaker ensemble with observed tropical surface winds. The winds are observed from 30 south to 30 north across all longitudes. And then an AGCM ensemble where the AGCM is the atmospheric component of our coupled of our coupled model with prescribed tropical Pacific SSTs, either derived from the pacemaker experiments or from observations. Okay, and with all of this information, we'll try to test this hypothesis. And we'll begin with the first, uh, you know, how do we utilize the large ensemble? And we're just back to this curve. What we do is we average in the large ensemble trends, decadal trends, well, those trends um, in surface wind stress, eastward surface wind stress over this region. So that gives us 100 values. And then we do the same thing for surface temperature over central North America, which gives us another 100 values. And then we look for a relationship between the two sets of, of, of data. And we'll do that for the central North America, and we'll do it for the northwest part of North America as, as well. And this is how we present our results. So on the left, you're looking at the results for northwest North America. And here we have zonal wind stress trend on the horizontal axis with an inverted scale. So intensifying winds are to the right. And we have temperature trend over, averaged over northwest North America on the vertical axis. The observed value is this red dot here. So, you know, so here we have you know, intensifying trades and cooling uh, temperatures. The, the ellipse is the 95% ellipse from the large ensemble. That is to say that 95 out of those 100 values sit within that, inside that ellipse. And that ellipse encompasses the observation. So that's very good for the hypothesis. We also have that the red dot sits on the straight line, which is the be best you know, linear fit to the large ensemble uh, data, which is also a good, uh, a good thing for this hypothesis. The red dot also sits within the range of the values indicated by the pacemaker experiments. Now remember, the pacemakers have the observed wind stress, but they're free to determine their own temperatures over central North America. And this is the range across the 10. And the red dot sits within that range. So this is all supportive of this idea that intensified trades are the cause of cooling in this particular region, Northwest North America. And I think if you looked at, at Chang Ping's uh, figures in his nature paper, you would, you would conclude the same. Why does the straight line fall on the major axis of the ellipse? They're not, they won't. So this is the 95% confidence interval and there will be an offset between the, you know, between the best linear fit and the axis, the, the axis that describes the best kind of variance yeah, okay. connection. Okay, things are not so rosy for Central uh, North America. Okay, so now we're averaging over Central North America. Now the, the observations sit uh, here. So we have intensifying winds, cooling temperatures. We have that this red dot sits outside the 95% ellipse from the large ensemble. It doesn't sit on the relationship in the large ensemble between these two variables, and it's well outside the range of the, of the pacemaker experiment. So this would indicate you know, that this hypothesis is not working in the case of Central North America. So in a sense, it's, it's, a, it's a rebut to the Palmer hypothesis. Now the rest of the, the figures I'm going to show um, are going to be spatial maps. So we'll look at now you know, what this infor how this information looks in, in space. And, uh, <clears throat> In terms of the large ensemble, the way we're going to do this is a, you know, a familiar kind of approach. Is we take, we take from the large ensemble these average trends in the trades, okay, in the, in the region that I indicated earlier. So we have 100 values. And we regress those values against 
in the large ensemble the surface temperatures at every grid point in space. And that gives us a scaling factor, beta, which then we use to scale the observed, the actual observed trade wind intensification to get an estimate of the observed consequence on temperature around the globe. Okay, I hope that's clear. I mean, that's a standard kind of, kind of technique. And this is the outcome of that in panel B. The number of variables, the same variables I showed you earlier. So you want to look at this panel. And so you can see by this calculation that the trade wind intensification is associated with drying in the equatorial Pacific, um, warming in the West Pacific, weakening of the Aleutian low, and warming, not cooling, of Western, uh, of, of Central uh, North America. If you, so this is a measure of sort of internal variability. If you add onto that, you know, the forced response, which would just simply be the average across all members of this ensemble where you see warming, you get the pattern, the, the, the panel C, okay? And so this is what the large ensemble suggests is the connection between trade wind intensification and temperatures over, over uh, North America. And it's a warming, not a, not a cooling. And that's also what we see in the average over our pacemaker experiments. So the two you know, look very similar and indicate the Palmer you know, was, was perhaps uh, incorrect if you believe this particular model. Two minutes. Um, this just is, is a head-to-head -head comparison of the large ensemble and pacemaker computation just to make the point that I made a couple days ago that you can get a lot of information, the same kind of information from a large ensemble that you can from a pacemaker. Um, this shows that these results are robust against the large ensemble that you use. This is CAN ESM2 on the left, the quantities I just described, and, with, and it's 100 members. And this is CSM1 on the right, and similarly in CS1, uh, CSM1, you do not get a cooling over North America, you get a warming. Now, actually, Palmer, what he was suggesting, he wasn't thinking so much about the trades, but he was talking about warming in the West Pacific, producing uh, cooling in North America. And so we tested that further with an AGCM, where we took the pacemaker SSTs and we just prescribed them. They're trends, and we prescribed them and did a, these time slice type experiments. And so that's the calculation. This is the, the pacemaker result, where we have warming over North America. This is the AMEP type experiments, where we prescribed the uh, pacemaker SSTs in that region, and here we get you know, what we'd expect, weakening Aleutian low, and this warming in central north of the Pacific, cooling to the, to the north. You can break it down into where that's coming from. This is the case where you just apply the SSTs in this restricted area, and that recovers basically all of the pattern that you see on the right. If you do you know, really what Palmer was thinking about, and you consider just forcing the model with the SSTs uh, in the West Pacific, you know, you get a very feeble response, and in fact, it's warming, it's not cooling. So I, this suggests that Palmer was uh, out of his mind. <coughs> um, and here is, just to show you that this result that I've just shown you is, um, is robust against whether or not you use the pacemaker SSTs or whether you actually use observed SSTs. And so that's the observational pattern, and these are the, the calculations, uh, similar to what we did with the pacemaker with the similar conclusions. Yeah. So just, I had a question. So, in any of your experiments, did you get a cold? Any cold single cold? experiments? Yeah. Well, in the large ensemble experiments, yeah, you would get occasional occurrences, occasional you know realizations that would get cooling, but they're obviously few and far between. Interpretation is that's just internal variability of mid-latitude circulation. That exactly. To happen to have been cold. Exactly. So that's my second point. Yeah. Not not linked to the tropical Pacific. You know, I've learned a lot today about you know the involvement of the of the North Atlantic, possibly sea ice. Although we have a piece of work coming out that would suggest that that isn't the case. Okay. It's some other internal variability, but it's not internal variability. We have direct link directly to the tropical Pacific. Okay. Uh, yep. So you use the word cold, right? But you stop at some point at the SSD. We still didn't explain why the SSTs are warm. Well, the part of it is that why the SSTs are warm in the West Pacific. Yeah. So that combines. You say the winds, okay. But the yeah, winds, it notes the winds. But the winds are not decoupled from the SSTs. No. So, what well, we do say in this paper, what's well, more than in preparation, we've actually now submitted it. It's, yeah, no, it's the combination of the trade intensification will give you cooling, and that's demonstrated in our experiments. And it's also the anthropogenic warming 
So it's a combination. We would argue, and we have evidence to show that that's why we have warming in the West Pacific. Does that answer your question, Noon? No, I'm saying that we're dealing with a cutty system, sure. and, and it's very difficult to say what really causes no. what we saw. I'm being loose with my language. So I'm just saying, in these experiments, in this kind of experimental design, we can say that one thing is linked to the other, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, I wonder if the, as we were discussing before lunch, the Indian Ocean, you know, yeah. because you know, it's certainly to, to significantly, well, not significantly, you know, you, you might imagine a scenario where you have to change the Indian Ocean as well as the Pacific in order to really get the yeah. direction organized in that region. It's true. This is the good thing about coming to meetings, is I had never, <laughs> you notice that these, these figures are cropped at the Indian yeah. Ocean. I had not even thought about the, about the Indian Ocean, and now, and now I will, uh, for sure. Yeah, so I mean, we, we did demonstrate that there is, you know, enhanced convection, enhanced... Your, your last panel, you said you just changed SSD in that region. True. So that's not going to change it is, the diabetic heat. No, so we did, and we just changed the SSD. Yeah, you tell me how we changed the diabetic heating in an AMF. Well, it wouldn't, uh, in this region, I don't think prescribing SSD <coughs> will give you the right diabetic heating change. Perhaps not. Perhaps not. Stop. Uh, did it say anything about uh, the bias uh, that can be present in the model? For instance, if the ocean your viability is shifted to the west in your model, yeah. then you're not going to get an accord to go to the medicine. No, I didn't say anything about that, but we have, we have thought about it. Not, not terribly. Did you want me to go somewhere? Can you go in observation? Yeah, you can see that the main. Uh, there are two calls, two positive anomalies. Just, yes, in terms of pressure. Yeah. Uh, one very close oh, to yes. North America, which is not the case in the HC. No, exactly. That seems to be the key, is that, I don't, I don't know that represents a model bias. That could represent, that could represent the fact that this, that this ridging, is that what you're referring to? This pattern, this overall, this overall pattern. No, it's not in these experiments reproduced on account of the intensifying trades. There's something else going on that's producing the ridging that we see in the observations. So it's not uh, well, it might be or not. In terms of, we have thought about the biases. This model does have biases in the position of the Aleutian low. Uh, you know, it, it's too deep as it happens and it's shifted. It's slightly in the wrong place. Its PDO pattern is as good as any. There's papers that show this. Um, so we have like several lines of argument to suggest that it's okay and the biases maybe don't matter. And we have different We've used two different models. So we're just trying to build up the evidence here. Any other questions? Yeah. What are you using for observed winds? These are ECMWF. They're interim. Yeah. We do have, I mean, we, we have considered, we, did, we have looked at trends in all the reanalysis products that are available over this time period. And we have actually presented this in a paper and supplementary material. And they're pretty close for this region in terms of the trends, unlike the Southern Ocean. Yeah. yeah. We should talk about yeah, we should. There's a NOAA report led by Seeger on California droughts, uh, and that uh, also argues, like Palmer, that the Western Pacific heating, which is creating a ridge over the California, so that kind of supports Palmer. Palmer's, uh, right? Is that a wintertime connection? That's a wintertime. Right? That's a wintertime. Yeah, and you can get the report on the online somewhere. I will. Okay. Thank you for that.